Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. Memories of the Somme and Passchendaele were not to be blotted out by time or reflection. These words of Sir Winston Churchill demonstrated the lurking jackal of fear in the mind of many British commanders when, in November 1943, at the Tehran Conference, Churchill agreed to an offensive that would once again bring British forces into full-scale combat with the German Wehrmacht in France. The date for the invasion of France, codenamed Operation Overlord, was set for May of 1944, and Dwight D. Eisenhower designated as Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Force. He arrived in London in January of the following year to begin final planning. Although the obvious route to France was the short crossing to the beaches of the Pas de Calais, these were heavily defended and lacked a major port in the vicinity, a vital component in any invasion plan. There was only one feasible alternative. The landings would have to take place further west, on the beaches of Normandy. The task before them was daunting. They would be facing Hitler's vaunted Atlantic Wall, a continuous line of defenses that hemmed in Western Europe from Denmark to Spain creating the Führer's Fortress Europe. Concrete bunkers protected by machine gun nests and artillery emplacements with unimpeded views across the beaches where mines, barbed wire and underwater obstacles waited for the invaders, threatened to turn any offensive into a ritual slaughter. The men of the German Wehrmacht in France also had a legendary commander at their side, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. The Allied planning had to be meticulous and the execution decisive, for Rommel would exploit every failure mercilessly. If the invasion were to succeed without entire armies being wiped out, the only advantage that the Allies could gain for themselves would be surprise, almost an impossibility it seemed, in view of the vast numbers of men and equipment involved. Incredibly, the impossible became reality thanks to a deception on an extraordinary scale, Operation Fortitude was born. It is a tribute to everyone that Operation Fortitude kept the Germans in ignorance of the truth until the invasion actually happened. General Patton was put in charge of an imaginary headquarters in Kent, where he presided over vast concentrations of rubber planes, tanks and other equipment which the Luftwaffe were permitted to locate. False information was transmitted over radio, and whilst troops trained on the beaches of Devon in southwest England, the German high command was wrapped in a fog of uncertainty and complete ignorance of the true state of Allied readiness and the landing areas. Nonetheless, it was Hitler who guessed correctly Rommel was, for once, of the same opinion as the Führer and spent the first months of 1944 reinforcing the defences as well as he could. As a result, there was only one panzer division in Normandy on the day of the landings. By the time three more had been brought up, the advantage had been lost and Allied footholds established. It was nonetheless a perilously close-run thing. 
The other advantage for the Allies was their overwhelming superiority in the air. The Luftwaffe were non-existent during Operation Overlord. Without this weight in the scale, who can tell whether Overlord would have even taken place, let alone succeeded? Even without Luftwaffe support, the German soldiers proved that nothing could be taken for granted at any time. By the spring of 1944, the date for the landings had been fixed for early June, and the seaborne element of the invasion given the code name Neptune. The beaches were allotted names and troop formations. There were five beaches, starting with Sword, where the British troops would attack at the easternmost range of the landings, through Juno with the Canadians, Gold with the British again, Omaha, and at the insistence of Montgomery, who was to lead the British and Canadian contingents, Utah, close to the port of Cherbourg, to be stormed by American forces. The Americans were commanded by Lieutenant General Omar Bradley. Early in June, the invasion was scheduled to take place on either the 5th, 6th or 7th of that month, depending on the weather conditions. Only one man could make the decision to go, Eisenhower, who came down in favor of the 5th, only to be defeated by reports of cloud and high seas. At 4.15 on the morning of Monday, June the 5th, Eisenhower made his decision to go the next day. The bad weather played into his hands, for Rommel had left Normandy for Germany and his wife's birthday, and also to try and squeeze reinforcements from Hitler. Seventh Army staff officers were away at Rennes on map reading exercises. It was a small slice of Allied luck. At 16 minutes past midnight on June the 6th, 1944, British paratroopers, supported by five gliders of the 6th British Airborne Division, slid silently to land near bridges over the River Orne and the Caen Canal. Before long, these were in British hands. Operation Overlord had begun. Parallel to the British, the 13,000 men of the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions began dropping into the fields behind the German lines along Utah Beach. Many were killed before they ever hit the ground and those who survived were engaged in hard fighting that crucially was able to prevent German reinforcements coming in. The French resistance had also been hard at work, cutting telephone lines and increasing acts of sabotage. Waves of Allied ships bore down on the French beaches. Some 7,000 warships and transports that, by the end of the day, had landed 156,000 troops on the beaches, whilst the British and American air forces had flown over 11,500 sorties, backed up by naval shelling. The bombing over the German lines was ceaseless before the troops approached the beaches, although much of the bombardment fell behind the bunkers through worries about hitting the men now charging over the sands. All along the landing areas, men and armor were struggling through the waves towards the beaches and the vicious German machine gun fire and artillery that sent plumes of sand into the air. Overhead, the air was pierced with the shrieking thunder of Allied bombs and shells. Offshore from Utah Beach, the first of some 23,500 Americans encountered calmer waters and were even able to swim in. They met heavy flanking fire, but it was insufficient to prevent the motorized units pushing inland and joining forces with the paratroopers. On Sword Beach, easternmost flank of the landing beaches, where the most intense naval bombardment during the D-Day landings took place, the British landings, scheduled for 7.30 a.m., had also made an auspicious start. With tanks firing in support, the British raced inland, overran the shore defences, and soon had penetrated one mile inland. <laughs> 
Further to the east of Sword, however, heavy artillery fire was causing problems amongst the increasing numbers of men and vehicles now choking the beaches. At one stage, a large-scale massacre seemed about to take place, only avoided when the barrage balloons were cut free, depriving the gunners in the hinterland of their target guides. Coming in between the two British landing sites, the Canadians approaching Juneau Beach discovered that here too, the British and American bombers had struck too far inland, leaving the defences largely unaffected. The waters were rough, delaying and confusing some of the landings, whilst other troops waded into the water ahead of their support armour and suffered heavy losses. But the covering fire from the Navy proved decisively lethal to the defenders, and the Canadians pushed through the defences. They penetrated to within three miles of their objective, the town of Caen. They were confronted with a counterattack by the 12th SS Panzers, but even this they were able to repulse before making contact with British units from Gold Beach as darkness crept in. There had been 1,000 Canadian casualties. Gold Beach, the centre of the invasion, covered some five miles of coastline. Underwater mines and anti-tank obstacles combined with the rough tides made the initial British landings hazardous and many of the first armoured vehicles fell victim to the mines. But the aerial and naval bombardments had done their work, taking out observation posts and gun emplacements, and midday found the British in command of most of the coastal area. By the time they had joined up with the Canadians from Juneau, 25,000 men had been landed, and there were only 400 casualties, less than anyone had dared to hope. Confusion had been sown in the German command by the landing of British paratroops. The 21st Panzer Division, stationed to the northeast of Caen, was ordered out toward the British paratroopers, so that by 9 a.m. most of the tanks were moving away from the beaches. An hour and a half later, the orders were countermanded, resulting in confusion for the remaining vital morning hours. Only at about 4.30 in the afternoon were the panzers able to carry out their first assaults, where they met murderous British artillery fire that shot the panzers into flames and dispersed the survivors. One thing was clear to the German defenders. The 600 US Air Force bombers that pounded the town of Caen that afternoon let them know that the town was an immediate objective and had to be defended at all costs. Those who suffered most from the bombing were the inhabitants. The panzers fanned out in a crescent formation north of the town. Unfortunately, what was happening on Omaha Beach almost turned into a catastrophe. Heavy US Air Force bombing had uselessly been targeted behind the shoreline defenses. Two of the landing craft dropped the men into deep water thousands of yards from the beach. As the men floundered out of the surf, they were hit by fire from the German 352nd Division that not even the ultra-code braking teams had located. Once on the beach, there was hardly any protection for the men as the machine gun fire raked over them. Tanks and howitzers failed to reach the shore, so the men were left without covering fire. Had it not been for the Navy coming in at close range, the disaster might have been total. Under heavy fire, the engineers had tried to lay down paths through the minefields. Had Bradley not earlier rejected the use of British specialized tanks, known as funnies, which included the modified Sherman tank fitted with mine-exploding flails, the landings may have gone more smoothly.
The assault was turning into a nightmare as the offloaded vehicles piled up waiting for clearance. Men were falling everywhere as the Germans freely sprayed bullets into the mass of men and equipment. Bradley almost called off the landings in the sector. It was only by mid-afternoon that the defences could be overrun and the Americans start to make their way inland. It had been a terrible beginning that cost the 5th Corps 2,000 casualties. The Germans had been caught wrong-footed. Hitler was sleeping late and General Alfred Jodl, chief commander of the Wehrmacht, at first refused either to wake him or comply with von Rundstedt's appeal for reserves to be released. Not until mid-morning was the Führer informed of what had happened. Oddly, now that his hunch had proven to be correct, Hitler decided that the landings were a decoy and that the true invasion would come east of the Seine, and so he was reluctant to release troops to Normandy. Valuable hours were squandered at his headquarters, arguing about the intensity of the invasion. For the Canadians, the 7th of June catapulted them immediately into one of the most vicious battles of the campaign. Both they and the British soon knew as they advanced from their positions of the previous day into a wall of tanks and artillery fire that from now on, the Germans would give no inch. The Canadians were attacked by the 12th SS Panzers in a conflict that was carried out at point-blank range. The Canadians suffered losses of 3,000 during this first week of fighting. It was clear that the fanatical Hitler youth of the 12th SS Panzers would fight to the death. This was what they had been trained for since childhood. But the other Wehrmacht soldiers were no less resolute in the duty that lay before them. They were a formidable enemy. The bocage of the Normandy countryside was ideal for defensive actions. Panzers and gun nests could easily be hidden in the hedgerows, ditches and bushes. Before any breakthrough to Paris, let alone Germany, could begin, it was indispensable to occupy Caen. Far from taking it on the first day as planned, Montgomery soon realized that his plan to take the town in a head-on attack was not working. By the 10th, he had abandoned it in favor of trying to envelop the town from east and west. Whilst one arm of the pincer circled to the east of Caen, the 7th Armour Division, the famed Desert Rats of Africa, formed the vanguard of the move to the west of the town. The 12th SS Panzers soon stopped the eastern assault, whilst the Desert Rats moved towards the strategically important Vie Bocage, where one of the most astonishing feats of the fighting sent shockwaves through the British troops. Unaware that they were being observed, the British troops moved on unopposed into the town in the early morning of June the 13th. Here they rested. One man who saw them was 30-year-old Michael Wittmann, a tank ace who in Russia had knocked out 119 Russian T-34 tanks. A loner and adventurer, he quickly saw his opportunity and drove his tank into the stationary British columns. It was almost a massacre. As his Tiger aimed and fired in rapid succession, 12 half-tracks, three Cromwell tanks, honey tanks and men were consumed by the Panzer's firepower. The one Cromwell tank that managed to fire was itself knocked out. Wittmann returned in the afternoon with greater tank support and an entire row of Cromwells were put out of action. 
Before Wittmann's own tank was finally hit and he escaped into the countryside, hundreds of British troops had been killed and dozens of half-tracks, tanks and armoured carriers blown into smoking wreckage. For the Americans, the port of Cherbourg was the most vital initial strategic objective, destined to receive the supply ships from the United States, loaded with men and equipment without which Europe could not be reconquered. Sighted on the Cotentin Peninsula, the battle for the port was as pitiless as any other with the Germans resisting fiercely. Only on the 18th of June did the Americans succeed in cutting off the 40,000 German forces on the peninsula. It was now just a question of how long the German officers would withstand the onslaught. As the Americans pressed forward, they discovered bases for the notorious V-1 and V-2 rockets that Hitler was promising his unhappy generals would win the war for them. Von Rundstedt was later dismissed for saying that the war should be ended and replaced by Field Marshal von Kluger. Rommel also knew that attempting to hold a bridgehead so far to the west was ridiculous. Only Hitler thought otherwise and remained as obstinate as ever. Cherbourg's outer defensive ring was reached on the 21st. A demand for surrender was rejected by the Germans. So, on the 23rd, the American troops launched themselves into the city. With naval guns in support to counter the German artillery, the battle raged over the following two days until Lieutenant General von Schlieben gave up the hopeless struggle and capitulated. As the bells rang out in Cherbourg, Hitler was beside himself with anger. Whilst the battle for Saint-Lô was in full flood, Montgomery had set his forces once more to the task of a direct assault on Caen. In late June, the British had been involved in bloody fighting for Hill 112, and both sides dug into trenches in a repeat of the battles of World War I that were just as indecisive. Waves of British soldiers advancing through cornfields were cut down by the SS forces in defence and tanks crushed men beneath the tracks as advantages were won and lost by both sides. On the evening of July the 7th, Allied planes unleashed a vicious bombardment over the north of the city, flattening the suburbs under a blanket of bombs. The British and Canadian forces advanced over the next two days, grinding down the Hitler Youth Divisions, who had refused to withdraw despite the horrific bombing raids. Beating down their tenacious resistance, the British and Canadians pushed forward and entered the town on July the 10th, over one month later than anticipated. Snipers were still at work in the rubble, in which mines made movement even more precarious. The Germans were still lodged on the right bank of the city, and only on the 19th of July was the town finally completely free of German occupation.
Operation Goodwood was launched on the same day to the east of Caen to clear the Germans from the entrance to the plains of the River Orne Valley and divert attention from an American breakout known as Cobra. The assault was preceded by a massive bombing campaign that stunned the German defenders. It was followed up with sustained artillery shelling that crept forward in advance of the tanks and infantry. But soon the weather turned the supposedly ideal tank ground into a swamp. And after high casualties on both sides, the assault was abandoned on the 20th. Montgomery's already tarnished reputation suffered anew because of this failure. But Monty was wary of high casualties and unconvinced by the American attitude towards losses, which was simply to throw in even more men. Over in the West, the Americans launched Operation Cobra with a catastrophic bombardment. Bombs fell into the American lines and killed or wounded 150 GIs. On the 25th, the bombers flew in again, and this time the heavy bombers carpeted the Panzer Lehr Division and spread Napalm. Tanks were hurled into the air and blown to bits under the massive raid. Infantrymen were crushed in their bunkers, leaving their shell-shocked comrades to flee or surrender. Yet resistance continued into the next day, despite the German lines being severely reduced. It was a futile waste of life, however, for by the next day, the 26th, the lines collapsed. Thousands of war-weary men were taken prisoner. Eisenhower had not intended to liberate Paris immediately. He saw no strategic importance and was wary of street fighting. Neither did he wish America to be regarded as having imposed de Gaulle in power over the French. Allied troops were to pass to the north and south of the city and deal with the German occupiers later. But the Parisians wanted liberation as soon as possible once the resistance began to increase their actions. And on August the 19th, the citizens rose up against their tormentors. Tanks were sent against them and the rising cost 1,500 French lives. Hitler wanted Paris to suffer the same fate that Berlin would later undergo. He demanded General Dietrich von Kultitz, commander of the German garrison, destroy the city. With the words, Paris is not to fall into the hands of the enemy, except as a heap of ruins. Kultitz refused to obey the order. General Charles de Gaulle arrived in Bayeux in June and with his insistent voice in their ears, American and French forces began to move on the city on the 23rd of August. The British diplomatically asked for their forces to be exempted from the fighting in Paris for political reasons. There was, as always, fierce resistance by the Germans, with minefields and 88mm guns taking their toll of men and equipment. It was a foolish last stand. Koltitz knew it was futile, and next day he surrendered and was taken prisoner. Paris was free of its Nazi chains. The invasion of Germany now seemed close. Bradley's 12th Army Group was to move on towards southern Germany whilst the British 21st Army Group under Montgomery was to press on northwards through Belgium and Holland and so over the Rhine to crush the Germans in a wide pincer. By the end of the first week in September, the British and Canadians were working their way up through Belgium and reached the border with Holland. The Americans were close to the German border, but the Wehrmacht had a shock in store for both Bradley and Montgomery which cost both armies terrible losses and stalled the advance once more. Montgomery, believing that the Rhine crossings would prove the most difficult phase, had made plans for a daring assault at Arnhem in Holland. It was codenamed Operation Market Garden 
It was designed to capture eight key bridges and secure roads for Allied supplies, outflank the German defense of the Siegfried Line, and be in a strong position to face the German defenses on the Rhine itself. There were four Allied airborne divisions allocated for the assault, together with an independent Polish parachute brigade commanded by Major General Sosobowski. The British 1st Airborne Division, commanded by Major General Roy Urquhart, was to make the fatal landing at Arnhem. On Sunday, the 17th of September, over 1,000 Allied fighter planes as escorts for gliders and tugs flew out from Britain over the North Sea. Luftwaffe bases near the landing sites were attacked, but there were flak installations, although few of the 478 gliders were actually hit. Soon, 2,000 Allied paratroopers filled the skies above Holland. Surprise was, of course, hardly to be expected, and the Germans quickly knew of the assault. As the British artillery barrage began at 1400 hours to open up the way to Arnhem, the inherent and ultimately fatal weaknesses in the plan began to manifest themselves. The most telling of these was the distance of the British 1st Airborne Division drop zones from the bridge at Arnhem, some eight miles and the need for three separate airlifts. It was also thought that little resistance would be encountered, a serious miscalculation. Wrangling between the Allies caused more supply problems, with the result that only half of the division was landed on day one. As the men under Divisional Commander Urquhart began to move in three directions towards their objectives, the German resistance grew even stronger. Two of the three British battalions encountered fierce defensive firing and were forced to abandon the advance with high numbers of casualties. Only the second battalion were able to make progress towards Arnhem despite the vicious street fighting in the town. The British, with less men than anticipated, were further hampered by radios which failed to work so the advances and attacks could no longer be properly coordinated. A devastating mishap. The jeeps of the reconnaissance squadron also failed to arrive or fell into German hands. Nonetheless, by 8 p.m., the first units of the second paras had found their way through the German defense around the town and captured the northern end of the bridge over the Rhine at Arnhem. They had with them only the ammunition and food they could carry. Cut off from the rest of the Allied troops, they were in a perilous situation. Their resistance was to become legendary. When they attempted to secure the southern end, the 500 men led by Lieutenant Colonel Frost were hit by fire from the SS Panzer Grenadiers. German tanks and infantry were now moving into position. The nearest British heavy armor was some 50 miles to the south. A worse problem had arisen, which the Allies had no idea even existed. The Germans had apparently discovered a copy of the Market Garden orders in a crashed American glider. From then on, the operation was lost, for the Germans knew every single move that was undertaken by the Allied forces. On the 18th, the British linked up with the Americans and reached Nijmegen the following day, where the Americans were engaged in ferocious fighting for the half-mile long bridge. Mortar and artillery began to pound the attackers. American troops in boats crossing the river under heavy artillery fire to storm the defenders on the far side took direct hits so that half of one company was wiped out before the bridge could finally be stormed and captured on the 20th. 
The narrow single lane road to Arnhem was now clear, but the delay had proven fatal. It was too late for the British parachute battalion at the north end of the bridge. Tragically, although no one realized, there were now no German forces between Nijmegen and Arnhem. Allied forces paused for the night. The chance for victory was missed. The Germans had moved their tanks into the town itself, and one by one they were pouring merciless fire into the houses in which the British were fighting. The town became an inferno of shelling and death. Crack panzer units and SS troops had been brought into position to deal with the assault on Arnhem Bridge. Frost had been told that within 48 hours reinforcements would arrive. They never came. Bad weather delayed the second wave of paratroopers on the 18th, and they did not begin the landings until mid-afternoon, at which time the Germans knew they were coming, a Luftwaffe was in the air, and the fighting on the ground was bitter. The fighting ebbed and flowed throughout the 18th. By evening, the remainder of the paratroops brigade had fought their way to within one mile of the bridge, but were still too lightly armed. And on the 19th, reinforcements could still not get through to the men on the bridge. Already the operation was badly delayed, and the situation continued to deteriorate. Some troops had not even reached the battle zone. The Polish paratroopers under Major General Sosobowski were not able to land at all that day and only arrived on the 21st. An attempt to break through to the bridge by the 1st and 3rd paras on the 19th met with massive panzer and artillery bombardments once the fog had lifted that virtually wiped out both battalions. The Germans under General Model were rapidly taking control of the battle and the British at the bridge were under severe strain. Their predicament was now hopeless unless a breakthrough was imminent. The casualties were terrible. The fighting for Hill 400 exploded in December, bringing hand-to-hand -hand fighting and shelling of unparalleled mercilessness, with Germans even shelling their own occupied entrenchments once the Americans had stormed up. For just over one week, it remained in American hands with terrible losses from German shelling. Then it once more passed to the Germans. The murderous fighting continued until February, when Hill 400 was once again in American hands and the Battle of Hürtgen was over. By then, the forest had no importance. It had cost 24,000 American lives. Rommel, who had been injured in an RAF raid, was suspected by a paranoid Hitler of being involved in the July assassination attempt. His chief of staff and commanding officer had already been executed. To save his family from arrest, he was forced to swallow poison. On October the 14th, 1944, one of the greatest German generals of the war committed suicide. And there was to be more bloodshed, ordered by Hitler, when a final storm of destruction rose up over the Allies and showed the incredible resilience and ability of the German soldiers. On December the 16th, a massive offensive was launched against the US Army in the Ardennes. It took the Allies completely by surprise, yet this was where the Wehrmacht Blitzkrieg had crashed through in 1940 and the Allies were foolishly caught out when they again ignored it. Bradley and Eisenhower underestimated the power of the counterstroke, and only by the evening of the next day were the reserves alerted, a lethal failure to act. Twenty German divisions burst through the American lines, with over 1,000 tanks and assault guns on a northern and southern front. The American commanders were stunned, unable to comprehend how the Germans could muster such a mighty force when they had thought it was on the edge of collapse. Whilst they contemplated and dithered, 
the German forces rapidly penetrated up to 20 miles behind the American lines. Hitler's plan seemed to be working, although his fevered brain had in fact built castles in the air. He envisioned taking Antwerp and a rush to the sea leading to a second Dunkirk, where the British would be cut off from their supply bases and forced to leave the continent a second time before dropping out of the war. As his forces raced on towards the Meuse River, Hitler's assessment of the true situation was as faulty as ever. There were no adequate reinforcements or supplies of ammunition or fuel for such an enormous undertaking, and the battle strength of divisions was far less than Hitler thought. Von Rundstedt was staggered by the inadequacy of the planning and the grandiose scale of the objectives. About 100 miles to the south, the 5th Panzer Army was attacking the US forces. These inexperienced young soldiers were overwhelmed by the Germans and were swiftly encircled. Elite SS Panzers thrust forward, once again showing what the Allies were up against when American prisoners and Belgian civilians were murdered with machine guns. By the 18th, the Germans had almost reached Bastogne, an advance of nearly 30 miles. One village after another fell into their hands despite an American build-up of reserves and defensive actions. The next day, a savage battle for control of Bastogne was underway, which forced the German panzers to avoid it by passing around it on both sides. The defenders were repeatedly attacked, but the Germans could not force the battle to their advantage. Once the weather cleared on the 23rd, the Allied air forces were in the air, and whatever hopes may still have been alive for the Germans rapidly began to vanish as the bombs rained down on them. Yet the fighting was so fierce that Bastogne could not be relieved until the 26th. The advance was no longer able to support itself, and Allied troops were fighting running battles to reoccupy the villages. Slowly but surely, the panzers were being driven back. The northern thrust was abandoned, but the reinforcements for the southern wing came too late to be of use against the increasing Allied build-up of reserves. Hitler insisted on no withdrawal, repeating his old mistakes with the same devastating consequences for the men who began to suffer heavy losses. Two days before New Year, the Allies launched a counteroffensive. On two fronts, the Americans thrust north and south in an attempt to entrap the German forces. It turned into a slogging match in the bitter winter cold. Hitler's reply was an attempt to eradicate Allied air power. On the 1st of January, the Luftwaffe swooped in over Allied airfields in Belgium, northern France and Holland. For over two hours, the airfields were pounded with bombs which left many bases unusable and hundreds of aircraft destroyed. Yet this enterprise caused the loss of over 300 Luftwaffe planes and some 250 irreplaceable pilots. As the fighting went on into the first week of January, even Hitler had to acknowledge that he had lost his gamble. Once the Allied forces had joined together at Hufaliz, they had regained control of the original front line. The Germans refused to give up their struggle, and only on the 28th did the Battle of the Bulge die out. Only Hitler had believed in the success of the attack. This delusion cost the Americans 81,000 casualties, of which 19,000 men were killed. 1,400 British casualties and 100,000 German losses. In the east, the Russians were closing in on Berlin with the same relentless aggressiveness with which the Germans had swarmed over Russia. The Allies pressed on alongside the Rhine fighting their way towards the industrial centers of the Ruhr. They covered Cologne with intensive bombing on the 3rd of March, 1945. 
what was left of the town was blown to pieces. 80,000 people began to leave, and the last German defenders escaped to the other side of the Rhine. 24 hours later, the first Allied units began to enter Cologne, the first major town to capitulate. The breakthrough came on March the 7th, when Patton's tanks reached the Rhine at Koblenz after breaking through German defences. On the 14th, Eisenhower was told that a bridge at Rehmagen over the Rhine near Bonn had been captured intact, an extraordinary stroke of good fortune that Eisenhower had hardly dared to believe in. He was, of course, delighted. Von Rundstedt was sacked by a furious Hitler, whose thirst for revenge was insatiable even now. Four of the officers responsible for the failure at Rehmagen were put before a court-martial, with the inevitable consequence. All four were executed. The bridge came under constant German air attack, but the weakened Luftwaffe were unable to reverse the situation and within seven days, there were 25,000 Allied soldiers on the other side of the Rhine. Patton had now cleared the west bank of the Rhine between Koblenz and Mannheim of enemy troops, and on the 22nd, had managed to cross the river. Southern Germany lay before them. By the 23rd, Following a tremendous bombardment by 3,000 guns and waves of bombers, paratroops and infantry were storming into Germany. Operation Plunder then swung into action, and in just five days, 14 pontoons had been set up over the river. Under Montgomery's command, over one million men poured over onto the eastern bank of the Rhine near Wesel. Resistance crumbled all over Germany. There was hardly anything left with which to defend the fatherland. The lifeblood of Hitler's Reich was ebbing fast. Six weeks later, the whole rotten edifice was to crash to the ground. The Americans reached Munich and the Elbe, where they met up with the Russians. Montgomery had led his troops towards northern Germany as swiftly as possible, preventing the Russians from occupying even more of the country than they eventually did. In May, Germany capitulated. Montgomery accepted the surrender of the northern German forces in Lüneburg. The killing was finally over.